But when you hear people say things like, we only have 60 years of topsoil left, what does that mean to you? Can you explain that? Yeah, this this figure, you know, like anything else, is really an estimate at current rates of depletion. Right. And it's such a complex idea that no one is going to pretend that this is an exact figure or that it wouldn't change because obviously what we do tomorrow and in the years coming is going to affect that. So uh, I don't want anyone to ever hear a stat like that and think that means that it's set in stone. Yeah. But the idea, you know, really circles back to this concept of sustainability that has become so overused. But we really want to remember that if something is, quote, unsustainable, that it has an actual expiration date. It will run out at the at the rate in which we're using it up if we're not cautious about regenerating. And so when we're in this extraction mentality, unfortunately, because of the way that, you know, uh, our whole economy works, we have to actually increase we're always in this chase to increase, increase, increase production. But the paradox is that it's always at the cost of extraction. And so when we're looking at how the topsoil is depleted, what that means is we're only extracting. We're, we're doing farming systems that are not helping to increase that physical layer of topsoil. And this is, you know, physical layer that is loaded with these billions upon billions of microbes, but it's also loaded with these minerals and vitamins that are then going to be accessible to the plants. So you can watch farms actually be degraded to the point where they can't grow food anymore. And you can prop things up on a little bit of a crutch as you start to deplete those systems by adding in artificial fertilizers, adding in artificial chemicals, right? When the pests and weeds start coming in, it's usually a sign from nature that something's wrong and needs to be regenerated, needs to be fixed. And we're blasting those weeds and those pests out of the system. We're not really respecting that, that natural cycle. And eventually the soil can't grow anything. So you can artificially keep pumping in what's, you know, called MPK, these fertilizers that are mostly fossil fuel derived. So there's a whole other backstory of extraction and pollution that's happening there. Just to get this, this nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium, which has unfortunately been pretty narrow-minded in the last several decades of, of growing food. And there's so much more to uh, creating abundance in the food supply than just these synthetic versions of these chemicals I like to think of them almost as a steroid in the, in the sense that you can blast this in there at high doses and get a growth, but we're growing plants that are more and more fragile because the diversity of you know the minerals and everything is not going to be there. And they're really silhouettes of the plants that they once were. They're not containing the vitamin A, they're not containing the zinc, the magnesium, and all of these other compounds that even you know two or three generations ago we would have had in the same bites of food. So over time, we have land that is just unusable. And then what that means is farmers have to move on to another piece of land. In many cases, that means that they're chopping down more forests to make room for more agriculture. In many cases, it means that this becomes seen as just uh, completely valueless land and they have to move on. So we're forced with coming up with these solutions. Some of them you can do on the small scale, like composting. Some of them you can do on the larger scale, like regenerative agriculture, but ultimately these systems where we're cover cropping, we're actually protecting the life in the soil, protecting it from the elements, from being blasted with too much you know, heat and evaporation of the water. But we're also allowing the root systems to grow deep because this is a big piece of holding that soil in place so that it doesn't irrigate, I mean, so that it doesn't uh, erode. Because through irrigation, a lot of times, these soil systems, as they become more fragile, they're losing that life. They're losing that microbial system because they've been poisoned or overextracted. That soil becomes fragile to the sense where when there's a big rainstorm, you will see that soil wash off of that property. And you can even look uh, at neighboring pieces of land that are doing regenerative practices or cover cropping where root systems are helping to aggregate that soil and hold it in place versus conventional farms. And when a big storm comes through, that waterway will be totally brown, loaded with the actual soil and dirt that should be on that farm, but also carrying with it, of course, all those 
artificial fertilizers that are going to totally disrupt the water ecosystem. All of those artificial poisons like pesticides and glyphosate has become pretty well known, the, the, the Roundup chemical. But then you look at those neighboring farms and the water is actually coming off clear um, because that soil is not leaving. Things that are supposed to stay on that landscape are not eroding. So the erosion is a big part of that. It, it happens inevitably in nature, but we've sped up the erosion to such a degree. And eventually we will come to a point and we're already coming to a point in many places around the world that we can't provide for the resources that we need. And we can kick the can down the road and keep poisoning these systems, keep moving on to the next spot and erode that one and destroy that and extract. But as we all know, eventually you, you reach a dead end where there's, there's nothing left. Um, the beautiful thing is that nature does regenerate. And so, mm -hmm. you know, again, we don't want this to be depressing. What we need to know is that the natural systems are such that when you give the slightest nudge and the slightest bit of human intervention, could actually speed up the process for regeneration. If you have no human intervention, it will regenerate on its own uh, over time. And it will, and all those species will inevitably come back. Uh, you know, we think of like those post-apocalyptic movies where we start to see nature taking back over the cities, right? And this really does happen on a farmland. Eventually, you know, those small early keystone species will start to return and create the opportunity for the next species in that cycle to come along and participate and help regrow. Uh, there's an, another beautiful documentary called Biggest Little Farm that I highly recommend. It's, it pairs greatly with our film, The Need to Grow, because this shows a piece of totally desertified land. And in just a few years, it returns to a Garden of Eden level lushness just by a bit of human, you know, shepherding this system back into play. And I've also, you know, worked with uh, experts like John D. Liu, who do um, these restoration camps around the world. And you can watch video footage of these beautiful transitions that are, you know, maybe five to 10 years between what was totally desertified, empty, just dusty, dirty, can't grow anything. And, you know, crossfade into a beautiful shot of what he's transformed it into. And it's just lush, it's green. There's the water cycle, there's species that have come back. And so earth is designed to do this. Nature is designed to do it. It's just when we kind of either get out of the way or give it a little bit of a loving nudge in the right direction and we can really regenerate.